Because Cal and I have been NPing all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. Been. We had a ball, but it's probably just as well we didn't record that. <laughs> yes. Um. So. Uh, so this is Kersey, because I think you got, I think you, eventually you got the, I don't know why I put eventually in there, but you got the book, uh, oh, Personology. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, of course I have Personology. Are you kidding? Yeah. I love Kersey. Uh, yeah, I know you do. So, like, it really goes in, because uh, some background to this book, it was, a, is, um, David West Kersey was, he had cancer while he was doing the book, Brains and Careers. And so the book had quite a few errors in it. And so, uh, and as you can imagine, brains and careers, they focus a lot on the roles. Yeah. And so not many, of that, not many of, that, of that book were published. And so when they redid uh, brains and careers, they redid it as personology. But there's still a little bit of a hangover from brains and careers in terms of the focus. There's a lot of focus on the roles. They do also talk about the type but it's a little bit more about the roles and less about the type. So that's just a hangover of its origins as a redo of brains and careers. Uh, so here... Uh, so Ben, I don't think you've told people what our topic is. Well, folks, our topic is in the title of the video, and it is going through uh, this profile in the book, Personology, and it's the ENFP profile. Now, by this point, Kersey did not use the MBTI letters because there was some stuff stuff going on legally about whether they should be allowed to use the letters or not. And I think he had moved away from the MBTI dichotomies and wanting to use his own dichotomies. So the actual name of this type is Diplomatic Collaborator. So diplomatic enabler. So that's the NF, the idealist temperament. That looks like collaborating. Oh, oh, it's one of two advocators. Yeah, it's um, it's like the interaction style is collaborate. So it's he had his own version of interaction styles. I call them interaction modes because it's not actual name for them. Um, and so complementary collaborators is the same as get things going. Responsive accommodators is the same as behind the scenes. Okay. Preemptive initiators is the same as in charge. And competitive contenders, actually that should be confrontative contenders. Uh, it's, it's that elsewhere in the book. Um, they are, they're the equivalent of chart the course. So it's a slightly different angle on... Um, interaction styles and it's focused to the kinds of work that people are predisposed to and so i like and the, the benefit of this is that it's quicker to call the call a type so diplomatic collaborator and so um diplomatic enabling is sort of like the natural intelligence of the idealist temperament and so uh, the name of the type that we would say is enfp or in Socionics, Intuitive Ethical Extrovert, is Diplomatic Collaborator. Temperament and Interaction Style. Now in Barons, that would be, uh, oh dear, <laughs> I've forgotten, what is it? E uh, e catalyst, e e Catalyst, e Get yeah, Things get Going, thing, that's it. Yeah, Get Things Going Catalyst, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so he has this, and now neatly he has the types arranged in terms of how far away they are in uh in, in terms of the things that we're going to, but we'll get on to that i'll read through this bit idealists make sure that their actions both word use and tool use conform to regional norms yeah this is something that's a little bit um a little bit tricky with because as you know carol there's differences between guardians and idealists are both cooperative yeah but you're an example of this in terms of well you had your regional norms in the south but you also had your like idealist beliefs and things that was that would sometimes got to a point where they got into conflict yeah with that so the way in which idealists are cooperative is different from the way guardians are cooperative guardians yeah. are really cooperative yes Gu guardians get the rules business and the hierarchy 
And speaking from my perspective, ENFP, we don't really so much care about the hierarchy or the rules, but in spirit, we want to be cooperative. So I think my experience with guardian stabilizers in the workplace is they get it that I want to get along and that I'm respectful and that they like the fact that I'm cooperative. Um, I try not to scare them with too many of my jumping off the diving board ideas, but uh, and also try to not not say too much about not. I mean, I, I'm not loyal to somebody because of the place in the hierarchy, which is pretty much where a guardian stabilizer would automatically give some loyalty to place in the hierarchy. To me, it's if I respect and admire that person, believe in what they're doing. I, I as a collaborating advocate, will go a very long way for a leader who I believe in what they're doing and how they're doing it. I think um, with this, this uh, it's one of these things that to noodle on in terms of when idealists are cooperative and when they're not. And I feel that there is a tendency amongst idealists towards, if, if, you, if you were to talk to them about what kind of society they wanted, I would say that on average, they then start, they, they will talk about people working together with a common purpose. And that's the part of the cooperative aspect I see in idealists. Yeah. Whereas artisans are going on about individual freedom. Now, you can have some. Now, I think Rachel, uh, I don't want to say, I don't, I'm careful with female surnames on my channel. So we know as R. Dub. She's a very interesting person because, very interesting person, full stop, but also in on this particular point, is she's libertarian, but she's libertarian in the idealist way, in that for her, she's talking about a sense of community. And it says, ah, there's a cooperative part. That's right. Of, That's right, yeah. So it's it's different from, because if we, if we just look at it on the surface and say artisans and rationals, so NTs and SPs are utilitarian. Okay, people are with you on that. Uh, they'll do things their own way. But then if you say guardians and idealists are cooperative, but then, you'll, then people say, hang on a minute, what about those those um idealists that protest against social norms so that's the thing is like there's nuance in there with um but they cooperate the they cooperate with others to try to accomplish yes. a higher yes. social norm which they believe the words world should be going toward yeah so it's yeah, like cooperation the at the level of making the world a better place not cooperation at the level of status quo does yeah. that make sense that, yeah that makes sense yep and that fits in when i Better put than what I was trying to get uh, earlier on. Um, but you are a communication expert. <laughs> right. Um, you, you invite me here for a reason, Ben. I'm just trying to cooperate. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and so so that's one of these things that, like, because initially I was, I, was, I was worried about that. And, I, and it was one of the things that I would ask Jeff about a lot. That he, Jeff is my number one Kersey person in terms of talking about it on YouTube. He, It'd be great when he does more videos. Uh, and you've done a few videos with Jeff. Um, so, owing to their diplomatic brain. So, in the, what he's got in terms of diplomatic, he's got the diplomatic intellect, diplomatic enabling. Again, exactly the same as Catalyst. And you've got the mentoring half that NFJs are better at because they have a tendency to be directive. And yeah. those are directive roles. Right. And as Kersey and, and, about and it, then they use directing language. Yes. I am so, I am ENFP, get things going. I am informing language off the charts. And I had to, as a manager of people and teams, I had to learn, here's the, here's the spectrum here. Here's informing, here's directing. I had to move, excuse me, I had to move this way to get more directing, to be clear as a manager and team leader. So, yes, uh, extroverted feeling, INFJ, ENFJ, they're going to be directing in their language, probably in a polite, uh, you know, appropriate way, not going to be storming around about it, but they would be more naturally directing, whereas I would have to learn to use directing language. And I agree with you, it would help more in the mentoring role that they naturally were directing. 
and ENFJ, Cozy would call ENFJ, I mean, ultimately, he would call it diplomatic initiator, mm -hmm, and yeah. uh, Bowens would say in charge catalyst. There you go. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, but, and what Cozy wrote about that is the type is not the e when, he, when he was doing the ENFJ profile, and he had some help from his son in law, Stephen Montgomery, INFJ preferences, and a, and a good writer. Uh, what? what? Are you telling me Stephen Montgomery is Kiersey's son-in-law? Yes. Oh my God, I've read Stephen Montgomery. I love his. He's got a little tiny book on on uh, the. I can't. It's in the glare there. The people patterns. Yes. Oh, it's fab. Yes, Montgomery. Yeah. I highly recommend. He just goes. He slurps it down into its essence. It's just wonderfully done. Oh yeah, like he has this bit. It's going to be a tiny digression, folks. But like he he does the intellect in such a nice, uh, easy and simple way. So anyway, we're not going to get into that. I will resist resist the temptation. So um, we've got the diplomatic intellect here, and so and then he said that ENFJ they're able to teach even resistant pupils. So they've got that little bit of in charge and that little bit of extra oomph to tackle resistant learners that's uh, in line with the in-charge interaction style or preemptive initiation, as Kersey would call it. So part of preemptive initiation is being a bit more goal-directed and pushing towards it. Uh, and, of course, the confrontative contender has been a bit more chart the course, taking longer to plan the goal. And I think Bowens wrote about um, in-charge, it's about the the focus of attention is on the achievable results that's right and uh planned result for uh, chart the course chart the course I and uh, involved involving everyone forget things going and the best result for um the perfectionistic behind the scenes ones right infp in in, in terms of the catalyst area yeah. yes yeah uh and so what have we got here? Conform the reason. Owing to their diplomatic brain, they're instinctly, instinct, instinctually inclined to mediate between interactions in face to face situations. This in order to establish and maintain harmonious human relations. There we go, Cal. This is what I was trying to get getting at last time. That there's an FI part to interactions between people. You and I may always have to agree to disagree about that, man. <laughs> okay. I'm still willing to continue talking about it. I think okay. we've got some developed FE, but I find a usefulness yep. in typology and distinguishing between them and then showing they're both being used sometimes rather than melding them. Okay, okay. Right. So just for the record, folks, I think that there's... Now, I do think that it's more for... I think, I think for people that you don't know very well, I think for acquaintances... You're doing the relations via FE. I think it's people who are closer that FI might come into it in terms of the internal feeling of, like, based on your internal feelings, how what the appropriate interaction is and appropriateness in one-to-one -one relationships. And so say you would have, say, an INFP. So, uh, Virginia Satir may have resembled INFP. Oh, I where, love Virginia Satir. She right. really, she taught me about the, she describes what I think really applies to introverted feeling for ENF, well, introverted feeling, which is my second preference. It's about congruity. It's about yeah. if there's something incongruous going on between what you're being asked to do or participate out here and what's going on in here, that that's just a showstopper for me. It's too painful for it to be incongruous. And that I see as a big piece of introverted feeling. So I think she literally enacted this role of the reconciler of reconciler of alienates, reconciling differences between people. And uh, so we'll, we'll get on a bit. There. So uh, instinctually inclined to mediate between interactants in face to face situations, this in order to establish and maintain harmonious human relations. Some of them, say one in four, are instinctively collaborative in interacting with others. So they are aptly called diplomatic collaborators as such and tend to become efficient advocates. So this is like the equivalent of champion of a cause. Yeah, I, I do I do see ENFP preference as being naturally champion, championing causes, yes. 
Yeah. That 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 aligns for me. Excellent. <laughs> like other idealists, they sooner or later acquire the habit of using metaphoric words and adorning tools. Now, this is where we went a little bit INTP in terms of the adorning tools, and it's quite uh, a funny like, section. You're going to have to explain adorning tools to me. Yeah, that was, it was just funny. <laughs> it, it, it got really weird. It, it, it was an amusing thing because it was like, and he said he had arguments with the idealists in his life. And he wrote this in the book that he had arguments with the idealists in his life about idealists don't use tools. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he came up with adorning covers in terms of symbolisms of things, things which represent other things. And so the adorning covers part is the uh, the signals, the... I think it was a bit of a stretch. Like He was able to do it for all the other types. But it's like in the book, right, it's yeah. a funny section, and it's hard to explain. I've only read about half of it. and But as you know, his preferences came through where he was like going a little bit out there on a limb. Yeah. But I think it was about when he when he was writing about idealists, some of them presenting a certain image and and the cover being like everything that's congruent to that image. Something like maybe dressing in a certain way and um and like I said, it was like trying to push it in terms of tool usage to a way that didn't didn't quite work. So, well, um, now, since, since you've mentioned tools, I would say we don't tend to use physical tools yeah. very much. We can, but that's not natural. We struggle with it a bit. But I think I think our tools are things like facilitation and like language. picking up on signals in the room and about helping. Oh, I think I see what's man. You know, time out. May I try to mantra? I think what I'm hearing is is that that what you intended? I think it's our facilitation tools that that we're using inside our heads when we're working with people. I would think, I remember asking Victor Galenko about, uh, do you think, I asked him, do you think NFs have the highest on average linguistic ability? And I would think language, NFs usually would have the highest as a group, the highest verbal intelligence. Uh, and that language is a big tool for NFs because you've got to get your language right to coach people. Well, think about it. we're conceptual. We're we're intuitive, conceptual. We're not uh, concrete language yeah. folks. We're con we're conceptual. Uh, uh, Barons use abstract. We're abstract language yeah. people. So you know you better be using language if you're abstract in nature. You're going to have to use words to express that. And Kersey wrote something about NTs won't adjust their language, but idealists will, and they'll also take part in a bit of small talk. So idealists are used to adapting their language. For their interlocutors so that they're I'm, I'm not wild about small talk i, I have a I, you know i go for the real conversation that having been said i am perfectly willing I, I i feel the connecting purpose it has i really get i am willing to enter the little bit of small talk in order to say oh yeah now you're of my you know get the amygdala to recognize oh yeah this person's of my tribe now right. we can move forward. This is not, you know, foe, friend or foe here. Ah, oh, this is a friend. We can move forward. I right. get the purpose in that. I can do that. <laughs> so it's like it's coming from an idealist place, whereas that's really hard for NTs. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? We just no. have to, con you know what it is, though? NTs will adapt something if they can see the strategic purpose of it. If, yeah. you, if, if, if they see a purpose of it and it's pragmatic, they'll do it. Yeah, and if and if like other parts of their personality develop, um, yeah. uh, adorning tools are taking instrumental action, leaving the other word and tool usages to serve secondary and to them less helpful and less vital matters. Consider then um, one thing I would say though, in, in terms of creativity, like you know, idealists can paint and compose; they can use those kind of creative uh, tools. Uh, but, but not all uh, not all of us. I, not I, all of them. But not, I can't I don't do any tactical good tool no. using at all. Mine is all about words and, and things with people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say in general, as a temperament, idealists are the best at word usage because they are trying to get their message uh across. Uh and again, and then the metaphorical word usage will help with that. Uh Consider then how the diplomatic collaborator's career as advocator stands in relation to now. This is where you'll be a, a, make an extra good 
uh, contribution, Carol, because of your knowledge in this area of type and various uh, vocations for people. So I'm, 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 I've read, I love, I, I entered this whole field through Kiersey's Please Understand Me Too, okay? So I'm very open to Kiersey. As somebody who's also schooled in type, I'm a little less comfortable than he is saying this type's better at this for this reason and this type's better at this for this reason he's tying your type a little bit more closely to the behavior than i'm comfortable with doing i, I think there's some there's some good stuff in here but i wouldn't speak this way as telling somebody because of their type they'd be better at this job than this job does that make sense well this is the thing this is this is this is why i i repeatedly make this this, this distinction that what he sees, what he's doing here is he's comparing the role variants, the roles, not the types. So it's just that the role of crafter he sees is completely opposite from the role of advocator. It's just in, it's in terms of the, the roles and how far the, the roles relate to each other. So, for example, uh, with um, a designer and uh supervisor he's got those as roles that are really far apart because he's got the designer as informing reserved uh utilitarian and abstract and he's got estj as um concrete cooperative directive and expressive and I think there's something to that. It's very hard for INTP to go around and like make people stick to a process and enforce the rules and be oh, aggressive yeah, I, with them. So, yeah, somebody with those preferences would be a, would be a very different style of manager. They can be managers. They'll just be a different style manager than is somebody with the other preferences. So <laughs> one of the things that I would like in this book is that if he was a little bit more consistent, so... When he says here, what is suggested in the above frame of reference is that advocators are likely to be more efficient. What he should have written there is diplomatic collaborator because he's talking about the type. We have to be very careful when we're talking about the type and when we're talking about the role. And he's actually using, when he says advocators there, what he really means is the type and the type being diplomatic collaborator. It's just that the Diplomatic collaborator, aka ENFP, is predisposed to the role of, of advocator, just like uh, INTP is predisposed to the role of analyst or designer. It doesn't mean that they have to be that. I mean, right. Kersey himself was an example of a strategic accommodator, naturally predisposed to designing, but that wasn't his vocation. He was initially counseling. So his role enactment was different from his type. Hey. Uh, y yes, he was a counselor, but look what he did with it. Instead of yeah, just staying, he went back to his preference. Yeah, exactly. Instead of just staying in private practice as a therapist, he was a professor and he went on to develop models. I mean, right, leading with introverted thinking classic. Yep. He developed models. So, and and one of I, I won't mention the name here, but one of his famous students I know who has INTP preferences <laughs> also started out as a therapist. Yep. And then went into consulting and teaching type professionals. And in that, she developed a model, another model, a social styles model. So isn't it interesting how even no matter what field they get in, if they get the chance, they end up going into their creating models in their head core. Yeah. Can, can I mention a name? Sure. Linda Behrens. <laughs> Dr. Linda V. Behrens. <laughs> Mustn't true. forget the V. <laughs> That's true. Kiersey was on her committee. That's right. Yeah. She, she and oh rats. Uh, I'll have to think of of. There's another famous published therapist now who uh, publishes books and teaches about using temperament and consulting, and it's beautifully done. He was her professor too. I'll have to think who that is. Right. So if I read through this, it might make it a bit clearer what. Uh, so we've got here. So, uh, so. Okay. When uh, what I'll do is I'll change it to what it should be. So this is like my INTP is on top of his INTP, but always changing other people's stuff. But so isn't what is suggested in the above frame of reference is that the diplomatic collaborators are likely to be more efficient as reconcilers than as educators. So 
Reconciler is the role, Reconciler of Alienate is a role that INFP can do well. So he reckons, now he does say that this can vary depending on someone's development, right. um, that ENFP, they're not far away from INFP. And so, and because, and because NFPs are both inclined towards mediating between people because they are informing, that yeah. it's easier for um, ENFP to do a reserved informing role of reconciling people than it is to do the directive role of, say, mentoring somebody like a teacher. Because, like for you, Carol, like, that's more of a stretch for you to go towards being directive than to being a little bit more reserved and still informing. It is. And, and Baron's model would say this too, that it's easier for someone and get things going to lean toward behind the scenes because yep. they're both informing. Yep. And when I go, I, I don't ever do in charge. I'm, I, I never turn in, I don't think I ever turn into the EN, ENFJ in charge catalyst teacher. I'm a very informing style teacher, but, and here's where another system comes in. I am a teacher. I have the teacher archetype. I mean, I, when I was a technical writer, I imagine myself standing behind the poor software user's shoulder, and as they were reading the uh, here, I got in front. They were reading the book I wrote. I was trying to speak to them through the book to teach them and help them use the software and and experience less frustration using the software. So I was like an in the closet teacher when I was a technical writer. So I think right. I have been a teacher all along. But isn't that interesting? My first teaching role was indirectly teaching through writing as opposed to teaching through in a more and then i went on later to be in front of the classroom teacher yeah but i think, it's, I, th yeah. I think there's multiple systems here and, and uh, there is an archetype there are carolyn meese would say there are different archetypes we participate in yes. and i think the teacher archetype is clearly one of mine but i think being a catalyst might be harder for infp because it just would require so much extroverting it might be more challenging to them but I, enfp is a familiar type found among journalists which yeah. goes with word usage and champion and also college prof university level professors and that goes with their being conceptual and they're having language skills so an example of an enfp preference college professor is mike from nf geeks it used to be a big YouTube channel. He's not done any videos for about the past five years, but Dr. Mike from NF Geeks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, okay. So bottom left and oh yeah. And so it, it would, and reckon it would be hardest for theoretically. So I think Linda Wood Bones would say that chart the course is the, is the longest flex from get things going because you have to go reserved and directive. She does. And yes, I agree. I had to do that as someone who uh, managed technical writing projects with like eight to 10 writers and 75 reviewers. And I could switch over there and I could do it for a while. And then I'd, I'd set up all the structure and set up the schedule, which was fine. But then I got to be my regular ENFP self speaking to people and leading meetings in a collaborative way and reaching out to people in other departments. I think if I had to do chart the course 40 hours a week, it would have driven me screaming from the building. Yeah. I could go dip into that to use it, but I would never want to live there. So we can use, I see chart the course as classic project management skills. You don't have to be that to do it, but I think you need to be close to that to want to do that all week long and not much else. So, and I was also raised by three chart the course parents. So I think, and that's in, you know, Baron, there's the, the, the born self, the, the, what you're born with, what you genetically have, and then your developed self, and then your situational self. So I think in my developed self, it helped that three, three of three, my three parents were all talking chart the course to me. And I didn't, yeah. I learned that from Barron's later on. I realized that all three of my parents, there were three different types and they were all three chart the course, but that did not, it was a, too much against my wiring to want to do that all the time. You're quite right. That's a, that would be too much of a stretch, but I could go visit there and I knew the language. And because all my parents operated that way, I had unconsciously learned some of that. Does that make sense? 
Yep, yep, yep. But, that's, but uh, Baron's right. Doing that all the time would be way too big a stretch. Yeah, so um, there's a good video on Linda Bowes' channel about it's called What is Type? And she's got core self, developed self, situational self. Yeah. Oh, that's, um, one of my, that's one of my favorite um, uh, images of hers is the, the, those three levels there. That And that helps. Ben, one thing that's really good for is it helps people not feel put in a box. You're making it very clear that you're creating a very big space for them to be an individual because the developed self is you're individuating in this lifetime and nobody's had your path. So yeah. you get to be an individual and participate in these patterns too. Yeah. So, so for an example would be, so if you've got somebody with ISTJ preferences, so logistical contender, chart the course stabilizer, and they're an artist. And I know, and I, I, I know a couple, I know a couple of examples of this. Someone who's literally an artist, secondhand knowledge, and then somebody who's musician with ISTJ preferences. They're doing something atypical, but they're doing it in a typical way. That's right. <laughs> yes, and I think Dario Nardi would, using his brain brain research stuff, he would he would be able to show you how they're doing it in an atypical way. Right. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the typical way in which they do it is like really following the technique and good procedure, say of art and the good technique of playing an instrument mm -hmm. and getting all the practice right, following all good technique. The, so doing it in the ISTJ way. Um, so it would be, I think it would be hard for ISTJ preference person to be a freestyle jazz musician but easier for the artisan to do that because then that's their natural predisposition to improvise. And I'm wondering if intuition, someone came from an intuiting place, if that would be easier, more natural to do the improvising than to do the rigid rules too. I wonder if that would be interesting to know, jazz artists. I imagine there are a lot of improvisers there and I wonder if there is some uh, catalyst there too. Yeah, I would think out of yeah, again though I because uh, I like this subtypes thing. I think there's a creative version of all types, and and an example of that is Kristen Rains, ESTJ, and um, I think she's created subtypes. She's using social benefit rings. This is a this is a someone with ESTJ preferences using cutting edge typology in teaching children. You don't oh, that expect that of ESTJ. Cool. That is very yeah. cool. Yeah. So, but her parents, though, one's INTJ, one's like INTJ, one's like ESFP. And she said that she always, like, wanted to follow the authority and do it in the right way. And they were telling her, <laughs> like, do it your own way. <laughs> right. Well, but think about it. As a guardian stabilizer, she is doing something to help help improve the next generation, help the next generation grow upright. There's a mentoring piece in there and a taking care of the next generation that, that seems, uh, it sounds like innovative, but a, a guardian goal of being helpful to the next generation. So what she did, Carol, was she would explain something to an ISFJ resembler, as I call it, or as you would say, ISFJ preferences. So an ISFJ resembler, but from the point, if, 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 and if she explained it, and, it, and if she, she would first try explaining it from the point of view as the, uh, an ISFJ resembler would understand it. But if they didn't understand it, she would switch to the point of view of INTJ. Cool. Which is, but it, and what's weird is these are all within the same social benefit ring in socionics. The problem is it's really tricky to explain and quite complicated, but in through these real life examples that Kristen has used, um, it helps to explain um, this idea of the social benefit ring. And that's and, and model G is arranged in a social benefit ring. So for example, quick graduation folks. So he's got a group of four. He's got ENFP, ESTP. No, wait a minute. Let's do the right extroverts. ENFJ. ESTJ, ENTP, and ESFP. And if you think about the roles... I, I think you meant ENTP, ENTJ, and ESTP. Yeah, it, Those are the three. Yeah, I mean, if the systems merge like this, you just named you just named three of the four in charge styles. Oh, but uh, you'd have to use ENTJ instead of ENTP. Right. Yeah, this is a different... 
thing. So it's ESFP, ENTP, uh, ENFJ, and ESTJ. What this is, it's it's all those are right spinning extroverts. It's okay. an especial socionics thing. But the weird thing is, if you superimpose the Kersey roles onto them, you see complementarity. So if you look at the ENFJ, if you look at, if you just compare the roles, teacher, I would say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recast ENTP as the explainer. They're naturally good debaters. Not all Absolutely. of them are inventors, but they're Absolutely. very good at communicating ideas. Yes. Richard Feynman, ENTP preferences was known as the great explainer. So if we think of the teacher role, that role of explainer that ENTP is good at is complementary to teacher. And then there's another one, supervisor, ESTJ, supervisor. Teachers have to supervise. And then there's also another one, performer, supervise the children. You've got to hold the attention of the, chil of the children by performing, which is the role of ESFP. So there's complementarity between those predisposed roles. And then it works with the other ones as well. And there's a weird connection as well. How about this for the connection, Carol? ENFP advocate with ESTP promoter, advocating and promoting. Now, usually the intent is different because you're advocating a cause that you really believe in versus, in versus promoting a scheme. Yeah, yeah. And, and this I'm not saying this is true, but I'm saying from within the lens and being unaware, the promoting scheming looks very can look amoral yeah. to the advocate who this is a cause and something I can believe in. And when uh, an ENT preference goes into playing devil's advocate, which is just playful and, and mind game, you know, fun stuff for them. But playing the devil's advocate goes hardcore against the catalyst core of right. of being authentic and really being behind right. something. I'm not saying those biases are fair. I'm just saying those misunderstandings right. are right are ripe for the happening. That's why ENTPs have the reputa reputa uh, reputation as debate troll. And I typed somebody live on air, and he actually said that oh, he just uses it to practice his debate skills. What, by advocating wow. a position that really upsets somebody? Right. And so that's that thing about the appropriateness aspect of FI. It's like they don't have an internal feeling of this will offend somebody. They're blind. They can be blind to that. And they only really know from experience how that Well, and from the model people. I come from, I would say that's immature use of FE. Okay. That's that's they they have a charming way of using fe but not a very not a very probably very practiced and developed way of using fe to moderate the space between themselves and others right uh okay <laughs> well, I, I, I get that example from a colleague ef enfj catalyst in charge preferences married to an someone with entp preferences Yep. And she would give a great example sometimes of how, oh, well, I'm not sure we should do that. How will that come across? And he would say, oh, no, it'll be fine. And he would just charge in and do it. But she was using the more, wait a minute, we need to step back and put ourselves in their shoes and see. And he was like, oh, no, they're our friends. It'll be fine. It was just a great example of a, a more developed, refined use of FE and a more playful, not so careful use of FE. There's nothing bad about it. It was just a regular kind of example of where her FE and his would get to different places because she would be wanting to, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. And he would be, oh, no, it'll be fine. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, she, and somebody resembles ENFJ, they're going to have access to FI. It's just that the FE trumps it. Uh, so, for example, and Kersey wrote about that where ENFJ can sort of like, be so attached to other people's points of view, they, they can because can can become alienated from their own sort of NFness. Right. And you've got a battle between authenticity and the FE part, which is a which is like thinking of other people in there and again different aspects of FE. But and, and, yeah. and baby would say somebody with FE dominant or auxiliary 
would be spending so much time in the FE mo managing the space between themselves and others, they yeah. wouldn't spend much time in their FI, which is much lower, you know, in their preferences. They wouldn't spend enough time in FI focusing on what's what's important to me here, what would I like here. And it's not a matter of they can't, it's that they spend more time focusing on the, the space between them and others than focusing on inside themselves what they would prefer. What about when they're on their own? In a state of introversion. Then I think they're going into NI, introverted intuition. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think there'd be a bit of FI there, but again, it's ignored. It's the, it's tricky. It's like, we, what would be good if we could do CBT on these people and find out what their issues are? Yeah. In well, and if, if, the FI, if the FI is in the shadow functions, which if FE is in your conscious one, yeah. FI will be a shadow function. For I, uh, if, if it's like in the uh, position five, opposing personality or position six, um, uh, which Senex? then you can get in the grip of it and, and use it. You don't, you, you know, unless you're really evolved, it can be used in unskillful ways. Um, and you can get really in the grip of it. And we can get in the grip of any of our functions, okay? Yes. Let, I mean, let's just acknowledge that. But I have seen someone with really refined extroverted feeling get in the grip of, you know, well, I really believe in this. I need to stand up for this. And she was going to alienate a bunch of people and not accomplish anything good. But she was really in the grip of, I was trying to think, why is somebody who's such a natural, uh, facilitative person and uh, doing, doing something so unskillful that's about to blow up a family situation? And then I went to a Barron's class and it just revived this for me. She was getting caught in the grip of her FI six function. And she was going to use it in a way that, and she was in the grip of it and she was blind to it. Her normal extroverted feeling, I think, would have overridden this, but she was in the grip of a FI function which she was not that accustomed to using. Right. Do you think she might have also had a, a, a one in the tritype? Yes, she might have. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, and having said that, we can all end up in the grip of an yeah. inferior function. We can. It, it just part of being human. So, for example, somebody like Jonathan, INFJ preferences. So. Theoretically, auxiliary FE, but you've got this like one thing and like the one thing in there, and like this the sense of right and wrong, but also the FE considerations. So, right. so you can see a little bit of extra FI, mate. So that aspect of FI, because different aspects of functions. Anyway, getting back to um, right, it is also suggested that advocators that. Well, what he means is logistical. <laughs> no, he means diplomatic collaborators are likely more efficient as suppliers than as modelers and more efficient as modelers. Modeler is the role. So this used this role used to be called inventor. ENTP can be good or rather. Most inventors are ENTP, not all inventors. Are, right. A high, very high percentage of inventors will be. ENTP will be like ENTP because you've got two functions there, the possibilities and the ideas and then the implementing it in terms of the extroverted thinking. It's like if that's developed, it's like if you see level three in Enneagram seven, it reads like the highly, the, the super ENTP that's the inventor. Um, but then there's an, another kind of super ENTP that's like the philosopher or the physicist like Feynman, but that, he's more NETI than NETE. <laughs> I was about to say, I thought you said he was ENTP. Feynman, Feynman yeah. famous ENTP, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ENT, ENTJ preference is another kettle of fish. That has yeah, a yeah. totally different feel to it. <laughs> yeah, when I was saying NETE, it was like, that's like, Dario did a paper called The Sixth Function where he wrote about, and he, and he was sort of in the speculation, and he was writing about Carl Jung's type, and he thought that The Sixth Function was very strong in, Carl Jung, and so he thought T-I-N-I for Carl Jung, and he was writing about, and you could say Bill Clinton, very strong FE. Whether you type him as ESFP or ENFP, he had strong FE. I think he has the, he has the charm. 
not Effie in the serious mode of making decisions about what's appropriate. Because let's face <laughs> it, there's a fa there you go. There's a famous inappropriate decision yeah. there that made world news. But and I love Bill Clinton. Okay, so I'm I'm not throwing stones here. But that I think we're seeing the charm, the less mature use of Effie in an ENFP is what's charming. But it's yeah. not the the more sophisticated use of Effie that's a pro making the decisions about appropriateness. Yeah, so this is one of the things where in Model G, I, I call it the, uh, and again, based on Victor's intent, the flexible implementer. It's it's an unvalued function, so it's, it's used as a tool. Again, used to charm, but it's not, the values aren't really coming from uh, FE. However, Carol, I, I, I frequently use the example that within ENFP, there's a battle between acceptance and approval and authenticity. And I see oh. that as a battle between FI and FE. I would agree with that. Well, but the FI wins out. But, yeah. you're, but you're right. It does create, and that's from my, in the U.S., Southern heritage. Yes, grandmother, Lyndon, and mother would do the appropriate FE, Southern FE culture thing. And I would have to do a battle, even though I was a pleaser as a child. ENFPs are classically pleasers as children. Even though I was a pleaser, especially, there was, especially as I grew up and knew that, found out there were choices to be made. Yeah, if it was if it was not coherent inside myself, it's really hard. If it comes to a battle between FI and FE, FI wins. Sorry. Right. So what we're going to get here, folks, this is going to be a multi-part theory because Carolyn and I are going in depth. We're not just skimming <laughs> through. So the reason for this decrement in efficiency is that diplomatic enabling, so that's what NFs are good at, folks, okay. and agenda idealists are so often committed to requires a diplomatic brain. Other collaborators, so get things going, equipped as they are with either a logistical, so for SJs, tactical, usually SPs are good at this, strategic NTs brain, right. are well advised to defer to, diplom to the diplomatic collaborator in situations where enabling others is called for. Yeah. Those farthest from attaining efficiency in diplomatic collaboration, that is arrangers, so INT, so INTJ, ESDP and especially ISDP, bottom right, are prudent whenever possible to avoid being miscast in the advocator role. Same criterion applies to dip, uh, diplomat, cl diplomatic collaborators who are therefore well advised to avoid being miscast in a crafter role. Uh, again, the role pre that ISDP is predisposed to. Yeah. While instinctual advocates, diplomatic collaborators, are the least efficient crafters, instinctual crafters, i.e. tactical contenders, are the least efficient advocators, or put it in Ben way, diplomatic collaborators are the least efficient in the crafter role, tactical contenders are the least efficient in the advocator role. And, and, I, can, and I can see, and based on eight function theory, and based on, you know, temperament, I can see how there's some sense there. Yeah, and so we've got here, so what I've, what I've sort of summarized here is type-related predisposition to enact certain roles. When playing, enacting those roles, there is going to be a role-related behavior. In my humble opinion, there is still going to also be a type-related behavior. E.g., Kersey Senior, when he enacted the role of counselor, a role best, best suited to INFJ, the diplomatic contender. So he would have done it, he would have enacted the role, but certain bits of like, it would have done it maybe in a slight INTP-ish way. In like, say the way he counseled somebody, he may have drawn attention to their thinking process and noticed certain things that maybe an INFJ wouldn't have noticed because of uh, the INTP tending to have a, a um, uh, uh, a facility with maybe certain things of looking at certain things and maybe the, the real INFJ or an INFJ in that role would maybe focus on more uh, on aspects more in line with their temperament so it would be interesting as to how Kersey would approach it as somebody who was INTP and possibly less in touch with his feelings than say an INFJ in that particular role uh, or just think of any INTP in the role yeah. of INFJ. They're going to be and, and, and a little think, bit less. 
And I think I think you're right, Ben. There will be many people with INTP preferences who would never go in that direction. That said, he had those interests. He does have a behind-the-scenes presentation, you know, sent air about him, like INFP, for example. The Originally, in the type groups in the 70s and 80s, the modal type of the Myers-Briggs community was INFP. Because the and INFP, they were a bunch of uh, counselors. It's only yeah. when the corporate people got involved in the 80s and 90s that the modal type became ENFP. So Kiersey, and, and seriously, we joke that the, the the psychological type conferences are the largest gathering of ENFPs on the planet. That, that's <laughs> one of our jokes. Oh God, I tried to hurt all those cats. Oh, exactly. <laughs> seriously, that that's why type conferences are kind of like. It's funny. We've got a lot of INTPs and a lot of ENFPs, so we're loud and we're heady. We're everything. Yeah. But sorry, I got I got off I got off into a joke there. But where I was headed there, he does. I, I've known INTPs, multiple ones in the workplace, and I've known one in particular who had no interest in counseling whatsoever. He was an IT guy, very heady guy. But yeah. there's something about that beautiful calmness and acceptance of that behind the scenes presentation. He'd be the person they'd pick out in the office to go knock on the door and say, uh, "Can I talk to you about something?" And he'd say yes, and he would learn far more than he ever wanted to know about this person and their problems. Trust me, he was not interested, but he would sit there in a very non-judging, open way and make them feel heard. So he never intended that to be part of his role there, but people sought him out for that. And I believe it's because he really did have a beautiful behind the scenes it's kind of warm in its openness. It's non-judgmental. It can come. It can be very non-judgmental and open to hearing input. That extroverted intuiting is open yeah. to input, right? Yeah. All um, the all the NPs being informing, all the NJs being right. directive. That's right. Um, so this is the wrong way around because when you see the previous table, you've got the uh, these roles here. You've got the tactical ones on the opposite side because it's furthest away from NF. Right. Because you've got concrete utilitarians, abstract cooperators. And so, but again, it was, it was the little, little errors in this book in terms of, the, it's just the way I read, I read really in depth. And so it takes me flipping ages. Um, it, it depends what it is though. If it's typology, I tend to take ages analyzing it to like find the connections. So, so, Let's check with Carol here. So do you reckon crafting devices would be like not much fun and difficult for you? No, yeah. I th <laughs> yeah. My, actually, my father had ISTP preferences and he took antique car. I mean, it is a hobby. He was an IBM systems analyst, but he took yeah. antique cars apart for fun. Oh, my God. Can you imagine this for yeah. fun? He took cars apart for fun and cleaned everything and fixed everything and put it all back together. And then he had a beautiful 38 DeSoto to drive around in. Yeah. He did. That was relaxing to him. Can you imagine what that would, how many, I'm serious. I'd have to be on pills, Ben. I would have to be on <laughs> what they used to call when I was a child, nerve pills. <laughs> if, if you wanted to, me to have fun at taking a car apart, that would yeah. not, so not be my idea of fun. <laughs> So I'd, I'd like the, the, the audience to have this sort of view of like nature, nurture, and to continually keep in mind with Kersey that he talks about type and he talks about social roles. And so here, so he's got this theory of intelligence, which is related to social roles. So you've got a logistical safekeeper, and then you have a predisposition towards these roles. And so we've got, okay, supply material protect belongings, supervise procedures, inspect products. So supply material is, Kersey would say that ESFJ is, is predisposed towards this role. But we know somebody called, um, we know Dr. Julia, neuroscientist. She's not supplying material, but she has got that sort of like an aspect of SI being comfort sensing. Right. Loads of guardians in the medical profession. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's and there's te a, and teaching, especially yeah. uh, uh, well, well, what do we call uh, we call it primary middle school middle yeah. school here. Lots of uh, introverted sensing guardian preference get drawn to yeah. great the grade school and high school teaching. So Kersey wrote that interestingly enough with nursing, loads of ISFPs in nursing and sociologists would say that that strong unvalued 
introverted sensor. Uh, but in terms of predisposition, ISFJ is predisposed to that role of protecting. Very good as nurses and doctors and ombudsmen. Right. I, 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 I w there's one thing I, I would like to have considered here. I, I grew up with someone, ESFP preferences, she became, became a nurse. A nurse. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely a nurse to, to, to the end of her illness, step her foot in the grave. She was a nurse. She went to college to be a nurse. She was fabulous and devoted to it. But she was, she did nursing in the ER and then for about 20 ah. years in the intensive care unit. So I think on a regular nursing floor where things are calmer on a regular medical floor, you've got a bunch of introverted sensing preference. But I think when you get to the ER and yeah. when you get to intensive care, you've got people like my friend. She said she knew and she didn't know anything about type till years later. She knew coming out of nursing school that she would be bored to tears on a regular floor in a hospital. And she started in ER and moved to intensive care. And she loved it because, it, you know, everything's intense. You're constantly adjusting equipment. You're handling cold blues. So I th cold blue, excuse me, cold reds. <laughs> <laughs> cold blue. I don't know what a cold blue is. <laughs> She's handling cold reds. So I think in the more active areas like that, you've got, and I think what draws her is not the introverted sensing. I think it's where her values are. She's a, yeah. she, um, she was, she rescued animals and she did nursing. So I think clearly from her FI came that helping, helping piece. I don't think that was from FE. That was from FI. That was her value. She rescued animals and she helped people. And the SE was her connection with the kind of nursing she wanted to do because you got to be in constant motion doing stuff. Yeah. It was never boring. The kind of nursing she did. Yeah, the extroverted instinct, extroverted sensation. To jump being, into action, that's yes. right. Being calm it, under pressure. And yes. and because and, 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 artisans folks, the thing one of the things that they hate the most, especially ESTP, boredom. Yeah, that's right. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, she's gonna handle right. boredom. So I was talking to a a, a GP recently and uh, and she confirmed that yeah, there's a lot of artisans in as paramedics and as surgeons and probably stps might be the best surgeons they've got the skill and the good under pressure and it's like if it's a case of i've got to get this fixed as soon as possible to save the life of the patients and you've got the expe expediency coming through so estps can make very good surgeons i think i'm pretty sure i had an estp dental um dental surgeon i'm pointing to the to the yeah. place <laughs> To the place he worked on me here naturally. I, I will say uh, Walter Smith, a colleague of mine, said he, some of the reading he's done, a lot of the surgeons end up now as intuitive thinking, not sensing thinking, because mm. you have to have, you can't possibly know all the details anymore. The fields are too broad. Mm. But the intuitive, intuitive thinking surgeon is okay knowing I can go, I can reason my way through it or go find it, but they would have the, they would have the conceptual strategic piece of it. Yeah. Um, I'd love to look, but while I haven't seen that data myself, but Walter said it made sense to him when we saw, uh, I can imagine used to be ISTJ would be a common uh, surgeon. Right kind of thing to do he yeah, said, yeah, but yeah, after when once that once the knowledge just exploded um it would be uh, although that can be one reason they do specialize a lot and i think they specialize yeah. a lot because there's so much to know it helps you to be competent if you're operate operating no pun intended but yeah. <laughs> if you're doing your work in a very highly refined arena i mean ISTJ is going to be one of those types to really really practice mm -hmm. i can imagine yeah. a, i can imagine i i can imagine an istj who's a pianist as a child really practice and practice and practice yeah. hours each day and uh, i think for people interested in cricket which is not carol alistair cook former england cricket captain played the clarinet very good mental strength i believe a istj preferences for him or possibly even isfj um right here we go 
Collaborators are instinctively complementary. Advocators are complementary in a diplomatic way. That's complementary with an E, folks. Mm -hmm. Complementary in a diplomatic way, but not in a strategic or logistical way, and especially not in a tactical way. Mm -hmm. Although it is hard for them to complement strategically or logistically, it is nearly impossible for them to complement tactically. Since complementing, since complementing is instinctive, it is both unwitting and involuntary, and thus neither deliberate nor intentional. In a word, it is automatic. Yeah. So automatically uh, get things going. Yes. And I would, and yes, I was get things going long before I knew what that meant. So I get it that I was instinctively behaving in a certain way in a room full of people, that it was many years before I understood that get things going is exactly what I was doing. And ENFP, co uh, collaborative advocator, is exactly what I was doing, yeah. And so we've got, and again, in role playing, so difference between roles and types, in playing their suitable role, these particular idealists are far more able than others to act as champions, as protagonists, as surrogates, as emissaries, as envoys, as agents, or in a sense as heralds for their clients in their client's social field. I am reminded less of the soothsayers as in the case of their fellow reconciler, reconciler idealists, but more of the minstrels of old. That, everything that's in pink amuses me. <laughs> more of the minstrels of old. Whereas clients come to the oracular idealists, the championing idealists go to their clients in an irresistibly active manner. I imagine the oracular idealists would be INFJ. This is hysterical. Oh, this is, I have forgotten how colorful he could be. This is hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you what, there was so much pink stuff when he was going through his ordaining covers stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, this is embarrassing, but champion idealists go to their clients in an irresistibly active manner. Oh, my God. That would be, that would be me. <laughs> I do a bit of that with her in typology, though, but when I'm on my territory, because this is a thing that Victor has where when the INTP is in their wheelhouse, so me with typology, it's like, oh, let's do this event. Let's do this. Oh, that's a little bit like a mini ENFP. Um, well, that's because you're in the grip of your extrovert intuition there, Ben. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me with the FE, yeah. Um, what have we got here? Active manner. We're, we're, uh, we're close to a wrap here, Ben. we got about 10 more minutes, so pick a good ending point for us. Okay, the ending point will be the end of uh, the end of this page, or the end okay. of paragraph five. Okay. Okay, let's go to the end of the page. Right. Okay. Uh, active. It was just oh, okay. the diplomatic they collaborators. Don't miss, they don't want to miss anything. Oh my God. OMG. Does that describe <laughs> NFP preferences? Not want to miss anything. Absolutely. <laughs> Thus, diplomatic collaborators are beyond compare as advocators of the aspirations of their clients. Yeah. And then I've put there as the role variant, advocator as the role variant, not the type. You know, Ben, uh, people with, uh, a lot of people in the States with the ENFP preferences end up in the coaching profession too. Yeah. And that's also INFPs and INFJs, pl plus other types. But I'm, yeah. I'm thinking in, if you go to an ICF meeting, there's a lot of, catalyst in there and more introverts and extroverts but and i do believe there'd be a slightly different flavor yes. to each one yeah. of them but that's okay because clients come in different flavors too that, and I, I, should, I do yeah. i do see as an enfp that i was probably a champion of the good thing they were trying to achieve and the goodness i could see in it for them that was probably the flavor i had as a coach i should maybe do if i was to do a comedy typology video i could do the types as coaches Imagine what the ESTJ coach would be like. <laughs> Stop, <laughs> your wh major. Stop your wine and get out there and hit the ball. <laughs> well, yes. Oh, wait, I've got it. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> yeah, because um, Jeff told me about it. Ben, ben, do you get that reference? No crying in football. I There's, don't no know crying in game. There's no crying in baseball. Oh, right. I didn't Hank, know Hank, uh, 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 Tom Hanks movie. I'm about as big on baseball as you are on cricket. But it's not about baseball. It was a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the view of advocators, or rather in the view of diplomatic collaborators, nothing occurs that is without significance, without meaning, without import. And they don't want to miss any of it. Adv diplomatic collaborators must experience all the events that affect their 
companions' lives and they're eager to relate their stories they've uncovered, hoping to disclose some significance about people and yeah. issues and to motivate others with their powerful convictions. Yeah. This strong drive to speak out on social events can make these advocators tireless in conversing with others. That's amused me. Like fountains that bubble and splash, spilling over their own words to get it all out. So yeah, that's the NE part. And there's the enthusiasm. Yeah. Their enthusiasm is, yeah, but this is like me when I'm in mini ENFP mode, the way I am about typology. Right. <laughs> so this is a thing in Socionics called supervisee shift. Um, like the fountains, the bubbling especially, and I thought I was to get it. Their enthusiasm is not only boundless, but contagious, making them the most vivacious of all the types and also inspiring others to join them in whatever agenda they currently pursue. The currently amused me. I noticed you <laughs> underscored currently. I get the point. Right, and then here we go. The concluding chapter of this point, we'll probably be able to make this a two-parter because it's about a five-page profile and the fifth one's about two inches. All right, like the other idealist variants, uh, what have we got here about flexible? Uh, something in there about flex. Ah, oh, yeah. Active manner, because they are an EP, and EPs are like extroverted and flexible, so that, that's part of it, part of the mindset of ENFP, uh, the flexibility. Uh, although that's going to be compromised, they're going to be by the NF part if they're like principled in a certain area. Uh, it, it, it would, their val getting a value stepped on would make, yeah. it, could make us less flexible. Yeah. Otto, Kroger, was, Otto Kroger used to say, you might not know what, for someone who, who uses introverted feeling as their judging function, you might not know what their values are until you step on one. Right. Because you don't, it's introverted function. You don't tend to say it out loud, but you'll find out when you step on one, because they'll rise up in defense of it. Also, ESTP is probably the most flexible because everything is negotiable for them, right. <laughs> <laughs> and their and their principles depend on how does it work for you. They, they might be the number one type to ask, "How is that belief useful to you?" Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about. Is that a useful belief, as Richard Bandler would say? As I give him as I give him as an example of a really smart ESTP, because you can really get into his thought process. Uh, but he's still arguably a little bit of a con man, like him calling himself Doctor Bandler when he's not a doctor. <laughs> and it's like that could be checked up these days, Richard. That's Chicky right, Chicky Bandler. <coughs> and he is entertaining, but yeah, but you know, as long as people get and so like the other idealist variations advocators or rather logistical collaborate no no diplomatic collaborators logistical collaborators as esfj diplomatic collaborators are rather rare little more than say one percent of the po now i agree with kersey on this what he did over the years is he vastly reduced the percentage of abstract types from about 20 percent down to 10 percent of the population at the end We'll get into that later on, Carol, in a separate event, but maybe it's a case of those people who are actually tested are in certain professions where there's a higher proportion of intuitives than, say, the general population. I mean, I mean, yeah, like, like if you look at the type table of, of the type, the psychological type conference, APTI conference. Oh my God! It is not the type table of the general population. Yeah. So you get to something like you get to a conceptual event like a type conference. You've got NTs and NFs out the wazoo. But the general, the last figures I remember him saying, and it seems to me he he cut the his numbers are a little bit lower than what the uh, Myers Briggs company says. Uh, he yeah. it seems to me it was like ten to twelve percent he would call idealists and 10 to 12 theorists. And it seems to me in the type community, the last figures I looked at, it's roughly between 23 and 30%. And I think it's lower because I think you get more people with a conceptual preference who end up taking, who end up are in jobs that they get the chance to take the yes, Myers-Briggs instrument. Thing. And I'm thinking it's even a little bit lower than the Myers-Briggs data says, but you know, who yeah. am I to say that? But that's just my, that's just my thought here. Yeah, it's um, and also we have to look, make we have to be careful in definitions between. And it's Linda Berin, like she wrote in her temperament book, Introduction to the Temperament, about if someone's a sense in type and they've been to graduate school, they might get mistaken for being abstract. 
but you've got to look for the intents behind the abstract yes because the sensing types are using it as a tool they're not in love with the abstractions for their own sake the way the intuitives tend mm -hmm. to be and Barron's was doing once she left the therapy world and she was doing consulting she was dealing with IT companies and high-tech companies in California and she was running into ESTP improvisers who were uh, 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 you know starting I'm missing the word Ben for the people who start the company the uh, entrepreneurs thank you the entrepreneurs the, the the entrepreneurs and she said Kiersey didn't really have access to that kind of of artisans oh are that, you saying, did, you, did you say an ESTP entrepreneur yes ah ha 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 at the back of personality he has this new group called adaptive enterprises where he puts together STPs and NTJs in the entrepreneurial realm the difference right. being tactical versus strategic right but that was and, later on that was yes, later, that was later on, on. that's 2010 earlier on his definition of artisan doesn't fit the corporate world very well well so that's why she changed it from artisan to improviser because she couldn't get people to resonate in the corporate world with the artisan but improviser is a thing they would value so she changed the names just because it helped as a consultant to yeah. get to to help lower people's resistance to to words so uh, that was just a pragmatic thing I think she did. I would say that Kurz's profiles, his artisan profiles are biased towards creative subtypes of all of the artisans. So he even has the artistry of the ESTP and promoting schemes. And then when unhealthy, the con artist. So, I mean, there is a predisposition towards creativity amongst the artisans. But it's like, again, looking at his profiles, it's later on and deeper into his profiles, he talks about them outside of their typical creative role so it, it, so 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 say an esfp profile he would talk about the role of performer esfp as a performer and then it would be like esfp in sales ESFP roles okay. outside of the right. predisposed ultimate role right and same with the ntp like he'd start with the ntp as inventor and then outside of that in other roles so because we we'll try and get to the bottom of this page uh advocators of robbery a little more than say one percent of the population but even more than others, they consider intense wait, 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 emotional. I wait, I can't find the one percent. Where are you seeing the one percent? Okay, okay. Uh, right at the, here we go. Number six. Like other idealist variants, advocators are little, are a rather rare, little more than say one percent of the population. Like I said, all of the intuitives mm, wow, put he, down to ten percent. Oh, that really. Just, just FYI, that's really out of out of sync with the uh, MBTI date of the Myers Briggs company. I, mm, that's interesting. Yeah, but what about if you think about your childhood friends? Though, I mean, was really like one in five people intuitive, or was it more like one in ten, and there being a r rare specimen? Yeah, but that's the whole group. I, I would agree that a catalyst idealist may just be ten to twelve percent, but not just five. Just ENFPs. Or... Yeah, I mean, yeah, but the, 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 is he referring to the whole NF group there? No, no, he's just talking. He, he, he just think he thinks he pretty much thinks that all the intuitives are about one to two percent of the population. Like, so all intuitives are, 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 are at most ten percent of the population. Like I said, he shrunk it down. Boy, he shrunk it down even more. I'm I'm not sure I would go that low, but I do think it's on the low end of what the Myers Briggs company says I do think it's more like both of them are more like 23 instead of 30 yeah. I just don't see how you get us up to 30 percent like they do yeah I mean it, I, and again it, I just think that the people that take the test are not representative of the population yeah. but anyway, again uh, ban, ban, wait the instrument please don't call it a test I can't you're right absolutely right. it's a type you... indicator yes there you go it's an instrument it's not a test yes right that's right nobody fails <laughs> Sorry, parents will have my head if I'm on a video where we called a test instead of an yes, instrument. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was actually Jeff that told me that, and he's absolutely right. <laughs> That's right. So here we go. Um, whatever percentage of the population they are, they stand out and are brilliant. Right, but even more than the others, they consider intense emotional experiences as being vital to a full life. Now, that's a little bit like ESFP, and I'm going to give you just a joke about comparing ESFP oh, and ENFP. I actually love this. Please tell me. <laughs> Here this. we go. <laughs> ENFPs are just like ESFPs, except ENFPs believe in stuff. 
That's exactly. You're good at quoting. That's exact. I heard him say that it was hysterical. Yeah. And I, I grew up with a, a kind of a spiritual sister. We we she moved next door when we were five, and we grew up together like sisters. She was ESFP, and I have no doubt she would say, "Oh yeah, that's Carol. That's the me who believes in stuff." Yeah. yeah. And then we've got. I think I've got something there. Is a little bit of something there. If like you've got sexual instinct and EP plus E seven ish and NF. Like if you put all of those things together, if any NFP is that might be you, Carol. Yeah. One to one, Andrew EP, Andrew seven ish, Andrew and NF. Seven. You know, I wonder. I would love to to hear Catherine on this. I wonder what kind of correlation she sees between ENFP preferences and seven, because I think there's a whole lot of ENFPs who who you have the seven, the in the the Enneagram seven. Yeah. I don't want to confuse people by mixing models here, but I would also love to know how many people with NFP preferences have the sexual instinct as opposed to the social or the uh, self-pres. Self-pres. Because that just yeah. looks like a natural in, uh, uh, intimate instinct. Seven uh, just seems like a natural correlation with what I know about in classic NFP. Yeah, especially if you've got that. I mean, I think the FI is because, and again, especially NFs because they want the soulmates, they want the connection. Yeah. Uh, well, Kirsty would say all the NFs want the soulmates. Yeah, 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 yep, yep. So, so folks, romance style. So, Kirsty's romance styles are NFs, soulmates, artisans, playmates, helpmate for SJs, mindmate for NTs. So that's but there's also another theory and there's a bit of it as well in that's a, a theory of complementarity in terms of say okay if you've got an INTP out there with a little bit of feeling their ideal would probably be somebody like Dr. Julia like the ESFJ neuroscientist the brainy ESFJ would go really well with the INTP so I would say Kirsey has a formula yeah. And his formula is, uh, uh, excuse me, he pairs the, I'm trying to, excuse me, I'm being torn between Barron's and Kiersey's terms here. Let's go with Kiersey since we're talking about him. Yeah. He would say the stabilizer tends to marry the artisan. Yeah. And one brings the rigor and, you know, we've got to do these things right. And the other brings the playfulness that the stabilizer yep. needs. And he would say that the catalyst and the theorist tend to marry each other. And that we pair up on the NFNT, and then one of us is IJ, and one of us is EP, or vice versa. That said, I do. I just want to throw this out there, okay? Because I thought about it. Kirsey, the way Kirsey got those things is Kirsey did marriage counseling. Ben, who was Kirsey seeing? He was seeing the married couples who needed to go into counseling. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm um, just a thought here. I'm wondering if he's seeing the people who married, who needed marriage counseling to get through yeah. the marriage with each other. I mean, you actually <laughs> said that you went to a type conference and the, you, and there were a load of ENFP resemblance there. And you asked them, how many of you have got INTJ, ISTJ spouses? And you said a lot of them put their hands up. Ben, I don't believe you remember this. It was a group of 36 people in the room. I was speaking in the D, uh, the D, the greater, the Northern Virginia area outside of DC. And, one somebody ENFP preference held up her hands. She she was married. To, her husband had ISTJ preferences, and how helpful that was to her. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm such an exaggerated form of ENFP. That would drive me nuts. I don't think I said that out. Maybe I did say that out loud. But she said, wait a minute, let's just see. And she said, how many people in here are ENFPs? And you know, like eight people held up their hands. And she said, how many of you are married? And they were all women. She said, how many of you are married to an ISTJ? And only two of the hands came down. So six of the eight ENFPs in the room were married to ISTJs. And and seriously, think about it. The ISTJs got everything going on that the ENFP would be struggling to manage. But I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. I, I would, uh, I, if, if you don't make each other wrong, if you really appreciate the complimentary nature oh my god that'd be unstoppable the liveliness of the enfp and the stability and the get the ducks in the row of istj especially when istj gets a little bit older that like that, that, that little like inner enfp comes out in that quirky sense of humor and it's like where did that come from 
in their uh, little bit of silliness when they get older. I have ISTJs. I have a mother with ISTJ preferences, <laughs> and she I, I I tell her there's a there is a mischievous little boy inside her because she has always had a sense of humor that could just comes out of nowhere and knock you off your feet. Yeah, terrible. and it's and it's and like. My, and my brother-in-law has ISTJ preferences. He married my ESFP sister. He has ISTJ preferences. One, he and mother have the same sense of humor that can just come out of nowhere and knock you off your feet. And two, when they stand side by side, they like vibrate together with this. <laughs> I, I, they just both know they know what's the right thing to do. And if Jan and I would just listen to them, everything would turn out all right. Because clearly Jan and I need them to control us. They love us, but they clearly want to control us. But they stand together, and you can just see them vibrating in mutual admiration of each other. So students would have the idea that, and Kersey's got ISTP and ENFJ as opposites. Would you say that ENFPs tend to have difficulty with ISTPs? I haven't had, uh, okay, difficulty is a very big word. Let me just say, yeah, it's there's there's different things to negotiate with trying with different types. I did have an ESTP client once, and it's not that he and I didn't get along. It's that we never really found a connection, yeah. and it's because we were just you know he was being conceptual, I, I was being conceptual, he's being <clears throat> he was being concrete, he was introverted thinking, I was introverted feeling. We just never had a ground to stand on together but there was never any difficulty i think the difficulty i would i would have at times in corporate america i i i have enough nfp going on i have a hard time rules for the sake of rules drive me nuts yeah. so if i ran into a guardian who was it just real the, like this about rules uh that would be hard for me i also have a hard time with in charge energy that's just overwhelm in charge yep. can be overwhelming it can also be charming but when it's angry it can be overwhelming so i, I think i think that's a whole different session um because I, I think the difficulty with that's a big big phrase and i think there'd it'd be different things to deal with and manage with different types that would yeah. be different levels yeah. of difficulty yeah because i think the yeah, because this is the thing. This is a good idea in socionics about intertype relations. We can talk about that in future, but we're going to get right. this. We're going to get this paragraph done because then it will be the okay. end of the event. Because That's I don't right. want Carol to say, "I'm oh, sorry, but I've got to go." You know, I've just got to go. We can't finish this paragraph. My ENFP preferences are taking over. Hey, I got to get to Costco, Ben. So we're going to finish this paragraph. Right. So here we go. So advocators experience a wide range and variety of emotions and oh, a absolutely. passion for novelty. Yes. So that's yes. the thing that's yes. in opposition to that part of NI, which is like chart the course, the chart the course part of NI. Because, uh, but so it's like high information for that, for NI stuff, like insights and how things might develop in the future. But and it can tell other people about how they see trends going. It's just the ENFPs themselves don't want to stick to it <laughs> because it's it's the novelty. Oh, this idea is more interesting. No, this one, this one, this one. And learning to develop that TE yeah. really helps ENFJ. And then the theory in socionics, well, the theory that Victor has is that ENFPs can go into ENTJ mode and get their TE on, get yeah, their business like, yeah. logic on. If and yeah. I and I've seen this, if there's a variety in the in the, if there's variety in the business and it has to do with working with people but like an ENF like being an accountant for ENFP is gonna be pretty hard I reckon I'm not giving you my accountant's email yeah, address yeah. man <laughs> I reckon it would be pretty hard for ENFP to enact the accountant role but roles of variety so as you do dealing with people various people there's lots of lots to keep it fresh and right. it's working with people yes. are in an enabling way so in line with and, nf and it's always different every class is different I, I mean it may be the same slides but every class is different based on who shows up at the room and what they bring to the room which makes it fascinating people people say how can you stand teaching the same thing it's never the same thing it depends right. on who is in the room and uh Passion for novelty, and so can become bored rather quickly with both situations and people, resist resisting repeating experiences, unless it's 
on the surface like with you like someone would say that's the same experience you're teaching that class and you say no no no, it's a different every time it's different participants that's right it is also they can go on you want to say something Carol? no no you're good well i was just gonna if you're doing it in a very rig rigorous way not letting the students express themselves and participate then i can see teaching the class is the same thing but if you're doing it in a way that brings people in and gives them space to ask questions and do you know the more interactive learning we do now than when you know when we were kids it was not nothing interactive about it when i was younger in school right <laughs> they certainly but interact if, with the ruler on your backside <laughs> <laughs> no no i always behaved i never got a ruler on the backside then but yes if you're going to make space for other people because it what is interesting about it is I will get to say more interesting, deeper things because someone asked a question that took us there. And because they ask it, I know they're interested and I'll go there. So I go deeper on different things in different classes based on who's in the room and what questions they ask. And sometimes if it's like down the rabbit hole, I'll say, OK, that's a real down the rabbit hole question. So let me see. And every time a group of NTs and NFs always voted to go down the rabbit hole together. Oh, yeah. But I always gave them a choice. But I would tell people, you know, talk about this is really down the rabbit hole. I'm happy to talk to you about that later one on one. I think, though, if you if you're going, we're going to go down the rabbit hole of practical applications, <laughs> then the sense and ties will be with you in <laughs> terms right. of if it's like rabbit hole of detail, useful details. Um, my, ra my rabbit hole would be the, the intricate theory piece yeah, that, right. that, okay, that gotcha. to explain something so that no thank you for asking i need to be more specific that's what i would going down the rabbit hole would be going deeper in theory than i feel like i naturally have their permission to do so i would ask for permission before i would go down a theoretical rabbit hole yeah, but then, if it's a room full yeah. of nts and nfs guess what they always the majority of them vote to go down the rabbit hole have you ever then like if you feel that you might be losing them and say well you didn't give me permission to get down the rabbit hole <laughs> it's not my fault it's so dark down here <laughs> no no i can kind of tap dance my way around that <laughs> also they can never quite shake the feeling that a part of the ah, there, this bit i like also they can never quite shake the feeling that a part of themselves is split off uninvolved in their experience thus while they strive for emotional intensity advocators often see themselves in some danger of losing touch with their own feelings that is a good bit you know ben i think that connects with something you said earlier there in intuitive feeling there is a catalyst catalyst there is yeah. a sense of wanting to belong and to feel oneness with Competent, other people yeah. and so if you're trying to feel oneness with well there like you said there's a natural tension between yeah knowing your own feelings and preferences here and then trying to to, to sh shape shifting in some ways to experience oneness i think that is a natural that can be a natural tension and i think when, i think that's me in my early to late 20s is being in danger of losing me and the experience in a group of people but as i got older i was less likely to do that well and, and think about it Jung, Jung would you know his whole his theory was about we're about integrating other pieces of ourselves and developing so our older versions are more robust versions of our type expression than we were when we were younger so carol i've just noticed a note that i made so if you look at the top where it says enfp is making them the most vivacious of all the types i'll put a little triangle there and then at the bottom don't tell the esfp that the enfp is the most vivacious type pattern <laughs> Right. So, uh, and, I, and I, yes, I put this bit very similar to Please Understand Me Too. And then I've put here, yeah, the ethics of relations part. Uh, and then ethics of emotions in creative stuff. So, again, it's a certain aspect of FE has to do with expressivity. So, for example, ICJ and INTJ that are really weak at FE tend to have poker faces and lack emotional expressivity, whereas... ESFJ and ENFJ tend to have very expressive faces. They do, but INFJ and ISFJ can have very calm, non-emotive. They're being very careful. Like, yep. like Kiersey would say it, not Kiersey, excuse me, BB. BB would say it's a slight misrepresentation of FE to think it's just about expressiveness. In its judging function, FE is about 
judging appropriateness of what's happening in this space between me and others and and realizing that emotional expression can cause strong reactions in other people so if you notice it's the ENFPs who are more expressive than people who have extroverted feeling because we're using extroverted feeling in a less mature way we're being expressive and fun with it, whereas someone who uses right. it your judging function is being more careful with it. Now, in, there can be a brightness in the eyes. When an INFJ, I remember an INFJ colleague once telling me what she loved about type. She's transformed into an ENFP right in front of my eyes, but that's because she was doing the sparkly eye thing, being so expressive about what she loved about something. So when they go there, they can do that 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 expressive, you know, sparkly thing in the eyes, but they are more more often they're using extroverted feeling in the cautious, careful way of let's doing this well, whereas the ENFP is is using the extroverted feeling in a more charming, expressive way, right. and I'm not using it. There's a dichotomy within uh, Model A and Model G. I call Model A Model Aters. Uh, but um, because of the decade it's stuck in. Right. But, uh, so there's a dichotomy called cautious, bold and cautious. So, for example, the extroverted functions in an extrovert are described as bold and the introverted functions would be cautious and the extroverted functions in me would be cautious and my introverted functions would be bold. So it's like Dario's idea of uh, from his, he did he got the research from the keys to cognition test that introverts overall tend to have a lot of comfort with all four of their introverted processes and uh for extroverts they have it makes sense because if they're actively involving in the world then it requires those functions well and my my introverted feeling it it i use it to drive my actions and what i choose to contribute to and believe in and promote but i don't tend to say it out loud yeah, it's it's all happening on the inside with introverted feelings. So you mainly see me using the extroverted feeling being expressive and extrovert intuition. It's all about options. The introverted feeling is kind of like the steering mechanism inside me. And yeah. it doesn't come out unless we're specifically talking about it. But Ben, I, I think we're at a good stopping place. Yes, yes, we are at a good stopping point. <laughs> now, earlier on, Carol, you said that you found it difficult to do in charge and the teacher role. I thought, you came very close to it in that in that that video we did about interaction styles because I knew that you had a certain amount of material to get through in the time allocated and it's like okay Ben that's a good point but I'll move on <laughs> it's like I thought you were very skillful in, in the way you handled me in that event because otherwise it would have been twice as long oh well, you asked me to present that Ben I was doing <laughs> yes, my, you did. You my, did my a very best good job. <laughs> And I think that's about as close as you get to the in charge. That's probably right. true. Yeah. And that was in service of what I, you know, trying to do the best I could with the learning. Yeah, and that course. event does very well. It gets a lot of views. Oh, and then cool. hopefully it brings more people over to Linda Behrens and David Kersey. So, right, folks, next time we're going to go through the rest of this. And it's going to be these three here. And he's got this cool little table at the end about which roles he thinks they find easiest to hardest and this is different for all the types so ease of uh but we'll get on to that in future we're not going to talk about what we're going to talk about else it'll be another 10 minutes so <laughs> i'm just going to go here and say it's goodbye for me i enjoyed it ben as always it was fun bye bye carol well bye bye, -bye carol to the audience but i'll talk for, for a little bit afterwards okay well end broadcast it's it's in the process of ending